you for lifting your voices in praise to God this morning. Uh, it was, it was just, it brought me to tears just listening to us praise God for who He is. And um, today we're in Exodus. Obviously, uh, the title of this message is Deliverance and Exodus. Uh, we're kind of, we're finally getting to that point where Israel is leaving Egypt, and we've been building to this point for so long, right? Uh, the text is going to be Exodus 12, 29, all the way through chapter 13, verse 16. And the theme for today is remember the Lord's redemption. Before we get into our message, I want to turn again to our Father and uh, just offer up some prayers to Him. So let's bow. Father, it's, this is a week that we set aside for Thanksgiving. It's a time when we stop and look at all the ways that You have blessed us, and we acknowledge that it all comes from You. We know that it shouldn't be just once a year that we should be thankful all the time. As your Apostle Paul said, we are to rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for us. And so we thank you for another day on planet Earth. You have given each of us life and breath, health, strength to be here. Thank you for that. You've given us all we need, food, shelter, clothing, and so much more beyond that. All the blessings that we have living in this free nation, jobs, opportunities, possessions, hobbies. Thank you for these undeserved gifts of your kindness. Thank you for our families, our spouses, children, parents, friends, for this body of believers. Each person, each family that is here is a gift and blessing from you, precious in your sight, loved and protected, graced and accepted. Thank you for being such a good God and Father. Paul said that we're to be thankful in all circumstances, and Father, many folks don't particularly like the circumstances they find themselves in right now. Trials, difficulties, temptations, discouragements, health issues are not things that we like. For many people, things are not as they had hoped they would be. However, Father, we thank you for each and every circumstance represented in this room, the difficult ones, the joyous ones, and everything in between. We're thankful because we know that you are in the process of sanctifying us, healing us, strengthening us, changing us into the image of Jesus, and use all these things for our good and for your glory. Uh, in the spirit of thanksgiving, Father, I also want to pray for our world right now. Father, you are in heaven, and holy is your name, as we sang. As there is war in Israel and Ukraine and other parts of the world, we pray as Jesus taught us to pray. May your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And thank you for giving us this prayer. And so we pray that you will destroy evil and cause your righteousness to triumph. We pray for your people who are in these war-torn places right now, your people who have placed their faith in Jesus and who are waiting for his return, just like we are. Give them hope in Jesus, strength of faith to persevere, and may they keep their eyes upon Jesus, to trust that he has the victory, whether in life or in death. We pray for their safety and protection, but even more importantly, I pray that you would supply boldness and courage to your people around the world to proclaim the life-saving power of the blood of Jesus, our sacrificial lamb who was slain for the sins of the world. And as your gospel goes forth, may thousands and millions of people place their faith in Jesus as they witness the love and the courage and the grace of your church and hear the message of your salvation. And may you receive all the glory. And so now as we take a few moments to read your word, this ancient text from Exodus that explains your salvation and your glory and your majesty. May you help us to open our ears and our hearts to hear the voice of your Holy Spirit and to respond to what he says. May we remember your gracious redemption. May we worship you in spirit and in truth. We pray this in the name of Jesus, the only one who is worthy of our worship and praise, the King of kings and Lord of lords. Amen. I'm going to start out with a question. I like to do this once in a while. Worship. What is it? What is true biblical worship? Kind of hard to define if you think about it, right? We've read that the people of Israel bowed down and worshiped the Lord twice in the book of Exodus, once in chapter 4, verse 31, and then in chapter 12, verse 27. But what does that mean? What were they actually doing, right? Were they singing? Is worship singing songs? It seems that Western Christianity has shrunk in the meaning of worship to just that, singing, which it is. I mean, we we sing in the morning, and that's, that's part of worship. But is worship just singing? How does the Old Testament define worship? Or how does it describe worship? What does it, what does the New Testament say about it? 
How does Jesus and the apostles describe worship? We're going to delve into this topic a bit over the next few weeks, uh, and then early in January as well when we come back to uh, the book of Exodus. Uh, So today's message is hopefully going to start us thinking about this idea of worship. Now, worship in the Old Testament has two basic uh, meanings. It means to bow down in humble homage before a lord, a master, or a king. That's, That's the most prominent meaning, to bow down in homage. It can also mean to serve a lord, a master, or a king. So worship can also has this, has this element of service. In the New Testament, uh, worship has one more added nuance. It has both of those, but also adds the idea of to bow down and kiss the hands or feet of the lord, master, or king. So this, this humility. Uh, the famous Psalm 95 starts out in the first five verses by calling all the people to sing and make a joyful noise unto the Lord and uh, come into God's presence with thanksgiving. And then in verse 6, it transitions, Psalm 95, to say, O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our God, our Maker. So worship can be singing and making noise and and praising God boisterously, but it can be more than that. Psalm 95.6, we find that worship is a posture of body, and more than that, it's a posture of soul and spirit. It involves humbly bowing down. And worship can be both loud and boisterous, but can also be quiet, humble, bowing, kissing the feet of God our King. The word worship is most always described as falling down with the worshiper's face to the earth when you, when you see it in Scripture. Other times it involves sacrificing to the Lord or remembering what the Lord has done or, or giving something that is costly back to the Lord or serving the Lord, obediently doing what the Lord, Master, or King says. And those things are the essence of, of worship as it's described in the Bible. Bowing, sacrificing, remembering, giving, serving. And as we go through the remainder of Exodus, we're going to learn a whole lot more about worship, and and we're going to do some biblical redefining and biblical reimagining of what worship looks like for us as Christians today in 2023, right? And why do I bring up worship now, though, right? uh, What does that have to do with Exodus 12, 29 to 13, 16, with Israel coming out of Egypt and all of this, right? Actually, it has a lot to do with our passage for today. Before we get to that, As Americans, we believe that all men are created equal, and we are. It's a biblical truth. All humans are created equal. No one is more important, more significant than anybody else. But as we live in that biblical reality, we often forget something, something very basic and very important. God was not created. God was not created. And because he was not created, God is not equal with us. God has no equal. And so when we enter a relationship with him, it is not a relationship of equality. It is a relationship of inequality, creator God with created humans. It is a relationship with a power differential, right? God is all-powerful. We are completely weak. There's a lot, a knowledge differential, right? God is all-knowing, infinitely wise, and we are foolish and ignorant. Stupid, really. In other words, he is God and we are not, and he is eternal and we are created. And what is fascinating about the relationship that God invites us to have with him as described in the Bible is that we are most fully human, most fully what he created us to be when we are in a worshipful relationship with him, when we embrace the inequality. That means that we are in the best place possible when we are on our knees before him, ordering our lives under the reality that God deserves our worship, our service, our remembrance, our sacrifice, In other words, God speaks, we listen. God commands, we obey. God gives, we receive. God acts, we remember, right? Being fully human means submitting ourselves to the fact that our lives belong to him and not ourselves. God says, this is how you should live your life. And we do it his way because, number one, he knows best. Number two, he gives us his power to do it. Number three, it pleases him to do it that way. And number four, because it's for our own good. And this is the idea behind biblical worship, the abundant life that Jesus talks about and invites us into. You see, worship is about way, way more than singing songs. It's about that. But worship is more than emotionally talking to God and singing or in prayer. Worship is more than reading 
The Bible, worship is an attitude. It's, it's an action. Worship is a posture. Worship is a remembrance. Worship is a way of life. It's an outcome of a God-focused life. You see, God redeemed Israel, book of Exodus, right? God redeemed Israel so they could have a relationship with him as their God, right? Remember why God was redeeming the nation? Why he had killed all the firstborn in Egypt? Why God had gone back and forth with Pharaoh? And why he had devastated Egypt with the plagues? It was so that the whole world would know that he is the Lord God and that Yahweh alone is the Lord of the entire earth. And he wants us to be in relationship with him. And so the relationship that God was initiating was the relationship in which God's people worshipped him as God and enjoyed an abundant life with him as they ordered their lives around him. They were redeemed for relationship defined by worshiping him. And the reason that God saved Israel through the Exodus was so that they could go and worship him. What was Moses constantly saying to Pharaoh? Ready? Let my people go so that they may what? Serve me. Right? And that word serve that's used there carries the idea of worshipful service. It was about worshiping God. And so the Lord God sent Moses to lead the people out of Egypt so they could worship Yahweh, to bow before him and serve him, order their lives around him. And right here in these chapters for today, we're going to look at um, God was beginning to describe this worshipful way of life to his people. And he was establishing what a God-focused culture would look like. The passage for today is kind of strange. We're getting delivered, and then he gives us two little or three little chunks of, of material that don't seem out of place, and we're going to look at why he puts it there. So today's passage teaches us that one aspect of worship is remembrance. Israel was to remember. They were to remember the position the Lord had chosen for them, which was remembering who they belonged to, that they belonged to the Lord God Almighty. And then it was remembering the salvation that the Lord provided for them, remembering the covenant that the Lord had made with them, and remembering the commands that the Lord had given to them. This is what they were to remember. So a God-focused culture, a worshiping culture, is a remembering culture. So our first point is remember the Lord's salvation. Now we're going to go back to verse 29 again. Um, You can just, I I already read it, so you can just follow along as I kind of step through that, but... um, Number one is remember the perilous situation that you were in. God's asking Israel to remember the perilous situation they were in, right? That's verse 29 to 33. It talks about midnight Lord struck down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on the throne to the firstborn of the captive in the dungeon, all the firstborn of the livestock. It was a perilous situation. Pharaoh rose up at night, he and all his servants and all the Egyptians, and there was, not a, there was a great cry in Egypt for there was not a house where someone was not dead. It happened. The Lord came through Egypt, killed all the firstborn in the land, all the firstborn who were not under the blood, just as he said he was going to do. And the cry in Egypt was great. There was not one house where someone was not dead. I want you to think about that for a second. Everyone in your neighborhood wailing because every house has someone dead in it. We used to live in the city of Waukesha, Wilson Avenue, a great little place. Houses are pretty close together. You can hear everything going on in the house next to you. You can watch people eat dinner next to you, that sort of thing, right? If every house in that stretch between Sunset and Main Street Walks had a dead person in it, goodness, right? How would you ever recover? The cry would be great in a bad sense. It would be horrible. It would be wailing, hopelessness, right? We will all be dead is what the Egyptians said, Right? They were in great fear. They, so the Egyptians sent them out in haste, like, get rid of these people. We are done. We are going to all die, right? And so the Israelites were to remember that perilous situation they were in, right? Remember that night, how dark it was. The God of judgment had come, and there was nothing that was going to stop him except the blood. Except the blood. And then they were to remember the provision of the Lord. Verse 34 so the people took their dough before it was leavened, their kneading bowls being bound up in their cloaks and their shoulders. The people of Israel had also done as Moses told them, and they'd asked the Egyptians for silver and gold jewelry and clothing, and the Lord had given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians so that they let them have what they asked, and thus they plundered the Egyptians. And, and the people of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Succoth, and we talk about that. We've, we've read how they, they left Egypt, okay? So, but God provided everything that the, Egypt, the Israelites would need to escape his judgment for their journey and for their settling in the new land. So he, the blood, 
He, he told them about the blood. He provided that blood, right? The blood of the substitutionary land was the first thing that he had provided. None of their firstborn died that night because God had provided the way for the Israelite firstborn to be redeemed through the blood of the Lord's Passover lamb. And then he provided wealth for the future, so the jewelry and clothing for the people. The Israelites were slaves, right? How would they ever provide for themselves when they got out of the land? And then they were going to be in the middle of a desert for a long time, and yet God showed them favor as they plundered the Egyptians. And the Egyptians gave them everything willingly, so they went out with the wealth that they needed for the journey. They had food for their journey, so they took their dough and their bowls. They took their flocks and their herds, which served a dual purpose, right? Food and worship, sacrifice, all that. And then they took the livestock for their worship, for their service to the Lord. And so flocks of sheep, flocks of herds of cattle, the Lord provided for sacrifices to him. So flocks, herds, which be sacrificed to the Lord as a constant reminder of the importance of substitution, the blood that, that God used to, to save them. So, so God protected, God, God provided everything that they would need as they left. He, and then he brought them out, it says. And it was a night of vigil. So the time the year, people, uh, verse 40, the time that the people of Israel lived in Egypt was 430 years. And at the end of 430 years, on the very day, all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. It was a night of watching by the Lord to bring them out of the land of Egypt. So this night is a night of watching kept to the Lord by the people of Israel throughout their generations. So it was a night of vigil. They watched for the Lord as he passed over the houses. Can you imagine sitting in those houses and watching God pass over? Right? They watched for the Lord as he brought them out that same night. And this night had been, has been celebrated for centuries since, a night of watching for the Lord. The Israelites were to remember their perilous situation they were to remember the provision of the Lord, and they were to remember the salvation of the Lord. Skip to chapter 13, verse 3. Chapter 13, verse 3. Then Moses said to the people, Remember this day, remember this day in which you came out of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, for by a strong hand the Lord brought you out from this place. No leavened bread shall be eaten. Today in the month of Abib, you are going out. And when the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, which he swore to your fathers to give to you, a land flowing with milk and honey, you will keep this service in this month. Seven days you will eat unleavened bread. And on the seventh day there shall be a feast to the Lord. Unleavened bread shall be eaten for seven days. No leavened bread shall be seen with you. And no leaven will be seen with you in all of your territory. You will tell your son on that day... It is because of what the Lord had did for me when I came out of Egypt. And it shall be to you a sign on your hand and as a memorial between your eyes that the law of the Lord may be in your mouth. For with a strong hand the Lord brought you out of Egypt. You shall therefore keep this statute at its appointed time year after year. So they're to remember the uh, provision of the Lord. They're to remember... The, the perilous situation, they were to remember the salvation of the Lord. Now, it's kind of interesting. Why does Moses put this? He repeats these instructions for the Feast of Unleavened Bread right here, right? As they're coming out, why does he put it here? Again, he just talked about it last week. The feast was a, le- a week-long retreat of remembrance. Life was ordered around a full week of remembering the Exodus. Food, gathering, celebration, rest, all that. It was not just a one-day stop you know, eat, pass out like we do at Thanksgiving and then Christmas, right? Uh, It wasn't a single day event. It was a full stop, a week long event. And when you sit for that long and you take a break from everyday routines of life for a week, you get refreshed. You have time to reflect and your children get restless, right? (laughs) You guys got kids, most of you, right? And then they ask questions, right? But why, Daddy? Why are we doing nothing all week long? Well, son, daughter, it's because of what the Lord did for me when he brought us out of slavery. It is a reminder of what God did for all of us. It's a memorial time. It is so that the Lord's words and the Lord's law will forever be in our hearts and spoken from our lips. That's why we do this. Okay, Dad, well, tell me then, how how did he bring you out? How did that happen? Well, the Lord did it with a strong hand. He let those Egyptians have it. Right? The Lord killed the firstborn in all of Egypt, and there was not a house where there was not a dead body in it. And the wailing was incredible, I remember. 
However, we all killed our Passover lambs and we put the blood around the doors and when the Lord saw the blood of the sacrificial substitute lamb, he passed over us. None of our houses were touched. When he saw the blood, he passed over us. Everyone was spared. It was awesome. And then we left Egypt in haste that night and we have been free ever since. And so they were to remember the perilous situation. Remember the Lord's provision. Remember the Lord's salvation, right? And all this activity and remembering uh, the Lord's salvation was also to trigger another memory, another thing that the Israelites were to actively recall. They were to remember, our second point, the Lord's covenant. Chapter 12, verse 43. So we're going to go back here to verse 43. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, This is the statute of the Passover. No foreigner will eat it, but every slave that is bought with money may eat of it after you have circumcised him. No foreigner or hired worker may eat of it. It shall be eaten in one house. You shall not take any of the flesh outside the house, and you shall not break any of its bones. All the congregation of Israel will keep it. If a stranger or sojourner with you Uh, Sorry, if a stranger shall sojourn with you and would keep the Passover to the Lord, let his males be circumcised. Then he may come near and keep it. He shall be as a native of the land, but no uncircumcised person shall eat of it. There shall be one law of the native and of the stranger who sojourns among you. All right, that's kind of strange, right? Why did God put that there? Why did he he have Moses put that right there at that spot in this story, right? Well, the Lord is connecting the Passover with the sign of God's covenant with Israel, being circumcision. We have to turn back to Genesis chapter 17 just for a quick minute here to figure out what's going on here. Genesis chapter 17, you can listen to me as I read it or you can turn there yourselves. But Genesis 17, verse 1, God is making his covenant with Abraham. God says, or uh, it says here, "When when Abram was 99 years old, The Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless, that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. And then Abram fell on his face. Get that? Abram fell on his face. And God said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you, and you will be a father of a multitude of nations. No longer will your name be called Abram, but you will be called Abraham. For I have made you the father of a multitude of nations, and I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into nations, and kings will come from you, and I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout your generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And I will give you and your offspring and a land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. This is all God working. This is all God's promise. Everything is for, for Abram. Right? And God said to Abram, As for you, you will keep my covenant, you and your offspring after you throughout their generations. This is my covenant, which you will keep between me and you and your offspring after you. Every male among you will be circumcised. You shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins. It shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. He who is eight days old among you will be circumcised. Every male throughout your generations, whether born in your house or bought with your money from any foreigner who is not of your offspring, both he who is born in your house and he who is bought with your money shall surely be circumcised. So shall my covenant be in your flesh, an everlasting covenant. Any uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin will be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. So God made a covenant with Abram that he would make him into a great nation, that he would be their God, that he would give them the land of Canaan, all by grace. The way that Abram and his descendants kept their end of God's covenant was to be circumcised. It was an identifying marker that signaled that they belonged to the Lord and received his covenant promises. The Israelites were chosen by the Lord and given promises, but they had to be circumcised to enjoy the blessing of the Lord's benefits. If one man chose not to be circumcised, then that man would be cut off from the people, right? He would not be a recipient of the promises and blessings of God because he had broken God's covenant that God had made with them. In this Exodus passage, God made the rule that anyone who had not entered into God's covenant through the mark of circumcision could not eat the Passover meal. So no foreigner could eat it unless he had been circumcised, thus declaring that he belonged to the Lord and desired to be part of God's chosen, uh, chosen race. Right? 
If a sojourner wanted to partake in Passover meal, then he would need to be circumcised to partake of it. He would need to keep his end of God's covenant, enter into God's covenant through the way that God defined through circumcision. And so God was not excluding Gentiles from partaking in Passover meal, from entering God's covenant with his nation, the nation of Israel. They just needed to do the things the way God determined that they should be done. Only then could they partake in the Passover meal. And there was one more thing that the Lord wanted the Israelites to remember to do, something that would demonstrate that he, Yahweh, was most important in their lives. And that is the consecration of the firstborn. Look at chapter 13, verse 1. The Lord said to Moses, Consecrate to me all the firstborn, whether, uh, whatever is the first to open the womb among the people of Israel, both man and beast, is mine. And then skip down to verse 11, chapter 13. And when the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites, as he swore to you and your fathers, and shall give it to you, you shall set apart the Lord all that first opens the womb. All the firstborn of your animals that are males shall be the Lord's. Every firstborn of a donkey you will redeem with a lamb. Or if you will not redeem it, you will break its neck. Every firstborn of man among your sons you will redeem. And when in time to come your son asks you, what does this mean? You will say to him, by a strong hand the Lord brought us out of Egypt from the house of slavery. For when Pharaoh stubbornly refused to let us go, the Lord killed all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both the firstborn of man and the firstborn of animals. Therefore I sacrificed to the Lord all the males that first opened the womb, but all the firstborn of my sons I redeem. It will be a mark on your hand, frontlets between your eyes. For by a strong hand the Lord brought us out of Egypt. So consecration was a sign of their dedication to the Lord, right? So the people were commanded to set aside the firstborn of animal or children to the Lord. The firstborn male animal uh, would be a sacrifice to the Lord, or to keep it, they would sacrifice a lamb instead to be the substitute. The firstborn son of every family would need to be redeemed with a sacrificial lamb. The lamb would be the substitute. It was saying the animal or this child belonged to the Lord. And I love how God anticipates the question, though. He created, he created us as humans. He knows exactly what our kids are going to do when you're sitting around the table or whatever, right? He anticipates it. Children would ask, what does this mean? Right? <laughs> Why do we do this? It seems very strange. Why do you consecrate the firstborn to the Lord? What, why do you set the firstborn apart as belonging to the Lord? Why the sacrifice? Why, Daddy? And so God gave the answer for the fathers to give to their sons and daughters. I ransomed my firstborn like God ransomed his firstborn. When Pharaoh stubbornly refused to let us go out of Egypt, the Lord God killed all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, the firstborn of man and beast. Right? This is why I sacrifice to the Lord all the males that are firstborn and why I redeem the firstborn sons. God demanded the blood of our firstborn sons. However, God gave us a substitute. It was the lamb. We put his blood over the doorposts. Right? So I used a substitute for my son now. It is a picture of what God did for us. And at the beginning of this explanation, and at the end of this explanation of, of these things that God is talking about in here, the, the consecration, the Passover, the circumcision, all that, God gives the reason for consecrating the firstborn, for celebrating the Feast of Unleavened Bread, all of this. And this is the point of the passage, the point of this whole strange little, little interjection that uh, Moses puts in here. And we know it's the main point because God repeats it four times. Here's the important truth that God wants everyone to remember. It is a truth that should cause us to worship, right? For by a strong hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt. Verse, chapter 13, verse 3. For by a strong hand, the Lord brought us out from this place. Chapter 13, verse 9. For with a strong hand, the Lord has brought you out of Egypt. Chapter 13, verse 14. By a strong hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt. Chapter 13, verse 16. For by a strong hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt. You get the picture? <laughs> right? In other words, we didn't do anything to secure our salvation. The Lord, by his power, resurrected us out of slavery in Egypt and out of death, and we are to remember this. That's what this is all about. I, we, were powerless to save ourselves, but God, with his powerful hand, brought us up out of slavery. I, we, were the object of God's wrath, but God, by his powerful hand, gave us a way to be redeemed through the blood of the substitutionary lamb. I, we, were doomed to die, but God, through his powerful hand, gave us life through the blood of another. 
We do all of this. We sacrifice the lamb to redeem the firstborns. We eat unleavened bread. We circumcise our males. We remember the Passover so that we remember that it was by his gracious, strong hand that we are redeemed, set free, saved, and given life. So that we remember the Lord's redemption through the blood of the Passover lamb. These are acts of worship. These are not works we do to obtain our salvation. It has already been done. We celebrate it. You see, all of these things pointed forward also to a fuller redemption, the redemption of all of mankind. Because you, you want to know what's so incredible. Jesus actually fulfilled all of these requirements. Luke chapter 2, verse 21, on the eighth day, Jesus was circumcised and he was named. In Luke chapter 2, verse 22 to 24, Jesus was consecrated or set apart or dedicated to the Lord just as the Lord commanded in this passage. Mary and Joseph took him there and they made the sacrifice. In John chapter 11, verse 45 to 53, John describes a situation where Jesus, Jesus died for the nation. He was the substitute. And then Mark chapter 10, verse 45 says, For even the Son of Man, Jesus said, For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. Blood, ransom, all of that, right? Jesus fulfilled all of this in the New Testament. Now back to Exodus. What was the response of the people to all of this? Exodus chapter 12 Verse 50, right smack dab in the middle of all of this is a key. Verse 50, all the people of Israel did just as the Lord commanded Moses and Aaron. And on that very day, the Lord brought the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt by their hosts. So they did just as the Lord commanded, and the Lord did just as he promised. I love it. When God talks about remembering, he's talking about more than a cognitive action. He's suggesting more than something that happens just in the mind and in the head. Remembering also happens in the heart. And the best way to the heart, according to Scripture, is through action. There is a physical element to remembering because there is a physical element to worshiping, bowing down. The notes in the Net Bible, I read this last week, uh, say this, the, the point of the word remember in Hebrew is not simply a recollection of an event, but a reliving of it a reactivating of its significance. In covenant rituals, remembrance or memorial is designed to prompt God and worshiper alike to act in accordance with the covenant. And I want to take you back through a few key verses from today's passage in Exodus chapter 13, verse 3. Then Moses said to the people, Remember this day in which you came out of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, for by a strong hand the Lord brought us out of this place. Exodus chapter 12, go back up a few verses, verse 26, 27. When your children say to you, what do you mean by this service? You shall say, it is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover. They're recalling something, right? Sacrifice of the Lord's Passover. For he passed over the houses of the people of Israel in Egypt when he struck the Egyptians, but spared our houses. A remembrance. Chapter 13, verse 8 and 9. You shall tell your son on that day, it is because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt, and it shall be to you a sign on your hand and on your, a memorial between your eyes that the law of the Lord may be in your mouth. Exodus 13, verse 14 to 16. It shall be a mark on your hand and frontlets between your eyes, for by a strong hand the Lord brought us out of Egypt. I want to take you to Psalm 78. It's going to seem a little strange to go to a psalm right now. You want to turn over to Psalm chapter 78. In Psalm 78, there are four movements. And if you guys are familiar with poetry, singing songs like that, you know, there's movements within songs and things like that, stanzas. Four main sections. Verses 1 to 8 set the tone for the entire psalm and explain what it's going to be about. And then verse 9 to 20, they talk about the exodus from Egypt, right? And then verse 21 to 23, talk about Israel's time in the wilderness, and then verse 24 to 72, really long section, talk about the signs and wonders that God did in Egypt before he brought them out. So it's, this psalm is about what happened here, right? And there's a reoccurring theme in this psalm. I wonder what it is. Remembrance. I'm going to read verse 1 to 4. The psalmist says, Give ear, O my people, to my teaching, and incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings from of old. Listen, things that we have heard and known that our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from our children, but tell the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and of his might and the wonders that he has done. Right? Think back to Exodus. What were they supposed to do, right? 
He established a testimony in Jacob, appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers to teach their children, that the next generation might know them, and the children yet unborn and arise, tell them to their children, listen, verse 7, so that they should set their hope in God and not forget the works of God. Remembrance, right? So we've heard all this stuff. The author's saying, we've heard all this stuff before. What I'm going to tell you is nothing new. It's been passed down from generation to generation. Our, our fathers told us every year at nauseum what this is. Like these stories and wonders of the Lord we know and we remember. And why? So that we don't forget. Verse 5. Uh, sorry. Uh, verse 9. Then the Ephraimites, armed with bow, turned back on the day of battle. They did not keep God's covenant, but refused to walk according to his law. Why? They forgot his works and the wonders that he had shown them in the sight of their fathers when he performed wonders in the land of Egypt in the fields of Zoan. What did they forget? The story of the Exodus. Right? So God gave these stories to teach their children so that they would set their hope in God, not forget his works. And, and the Ephraimites, they turned back in a day of battle. Why? Because they forgot the works and the wonders that God had done in Egypt. Down to verse 40. How often they rebelled against him in the wilderness and grieved him in the desert. They tested God again and again and provoked the Holy One of Israel. Why? Verse 42, they did not remember his power or the day when he redeemed them from the foe, when he performed his signs in Egypt and the marvels in the field of Zoan. And he goes on to talk about the, red, or the, the sea turning to blood and all of that, right? Why did the people rebel against God, test him, provoke him? Because they did not remember the power, his power, on the day that he redeemed them. So what is God trying to tell us here? That remembrance is of utmost importance. It is a necessary element of worship. God wants us to remember the position that the Lord chose for us, that we are his and we belong to him. Remember the salvation the Lord provided for us through Jesus, the sacrificial lamb. Remember the covenant that God made with us, that, that we are freed from our sins and we have eternity in heaven with him because of Jesus. And remember the commands that the Lord has given to us to love one another. And how he wants us to remember these truths is similar to how he wanted Israel to remember these truths. Not the same, but similar. Not just in our heads, not with a book collecting dust on a shelf somewhere, you know, in our, in our houses. Not by taking a snapshot, forgetting about it on the Facebook archives, but by entering into the remembrance through action. By doing and speaking and rehearsing and practicing. And here's what I mean. Gathering together as his people. So we and our children see with our eyes and hear with our ears and experience with our bodies that we are part of something bigger than ourselves. We are part of Jesus' body, the church, and we belong to him. By eating, so gathering, by eating the bread and drinking the wine so that we and our children touch and taste and see and smell the elements so we remember the covenant the Lord made with us, that we are forgiven of our sins, saved through his blood that was shed for us. So we gather, we eat, we pray, and we sing together so that we and our children speak and move and see and hear as we remember the salvation the Lord supplied for us. That we have eternal life and no fear of death or condemnation. We can approach God because we have been forgiven. And then gathering, eating, praying, and reading, studying his word together and alone so that we and our children read and hear and see and touch the word of God and his commands so we don't forget that he is our Lord and Master and King. And that's not just an Old Testament thing because it's actually right out of the book of Acts, chapter 2, verse 42 to be exact. It says, They, the, the disciples, the apostles, the people that were Christians, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, the reading of the word, to fellowship, gathering together, to the breaking of bread, to eating communion, and to the prayers or praying and singing together. A God-focused culture, a kingdom of God culture, a people of God culture, the kingdom of heaven culture, the, the culture of the redeemed is a worshipfully remembering culture, remembering the position the Lord has chosen for us which is really remembering who we belong to, that we belong to Lord God Almighty through Jesus. Remembering the salvation the Lord provided for us through Jesus. Remembering the covenant God made with us through his blood. Remembering the commands that God gave to us so that we don't forget. So that our children won't forget. I want to end with an incredible picture of what heaven looks like. Turn to Revelation chapter 5. This is the last passage for today. Revelation chapter 5. What are we doing in Revelation? 
Revelation chapter 5, verse 6. Between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw what? I saw a lamb standing. As though it had been slain. With seven horns, seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls. Get it? They fell down in worship full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open the seals for you. Why? Why are you worthy? For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation and you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign on the earth. And then I looked, and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. You want to struck me from that passage? Besides the obvious of all of it. It's about remembering what the Lamb had done. The host of heaven remember that he was slain. And then the host of heaven remember what Jesus' blood did for us. His blood ransomed us. He paid the price for our life. They remember the Lord's redemption. And you know what? That's just a snapshot of what we will be doing in heaven in the future. We will bow down and worship and remember that Jesus was slain and we will praise Jesus for the gracious blood that ransomed us and we will do this for all eternity, remembering as we worship him. And as we begin this now, while we are still on earth, We worship by remembering that Jesus was slain and that he ransomed us by his blood as we devote ourselves to the apostles' teaching, to the reading of the word, to fellowship, gathering together, to the breaking of bread, eating communion, fellowshipping together, and the prayers, praying and singing together so that we don't forget and so that our children don't forget and so that we remember the Lord's redemption. Let's pray. Oh, Father, thank you for the continuity in your word. From beginning to end, it is all about you. It is all about your salvation, your greatness, your worthiness to receive our worship. So, God, may we devote ourselves to remembering you, Father, as we worship you and your Son, Jesus, by reading, gathering, eating, praying, these these things that help us to enter into what you have done for us. May these not be empty rituals, but worshipful actions coming from a heart of gratitude and praise for all that you have done to secure our salvation. It is a done deal. We are saved and we have freedom and we are ready for heaven. We are looking forward to it so much. We can't wait to get at that throne and bow down and worship you there. Help us to practice that here. So may every man and woman, mother, father, child, and grandparent in this fellowship remind one another continually of your salvation and why it is that we gather, why it is that we eat, why it is that we pray, why it is that we read your word, and so that we worship you in spirit and in truth. Thank you for Jesus and his blood that was shed. Amen.